No mai hari mai. Welcome to Farmers in the Field, where our Earthworker alumni share their regenerative organic horticulture projects. Join us in co-learning through these biology-first conversations and growing radical hope through food. You can hear about our mentors in episode one. Come join us. Welcome to Tomtit Farm. So Tomtit Farm is a organic market garden. It's based in Matangi, which is about five minutes out of Hamilton um, and the Waikato. Um, so we're the farmers, Brett and James, and um, we'll sh- show you a little bit about our farm. Hey, I'm Brett. And I'm James. And, and we're, we're the, the Tomtits. Tom your friendly farmers. Just down the road. Here in Matangi. <laughs> Okay, so cool. So um, we started Tomtit Farm um, in early 2019 um, where we had access um, to some flat um, fertile land in Matangi. Um, so it was a big um, paddock um, and on the back of some lifestyle, essentially just a lifestyle block. Um, and we have slowly been working at this paddock and creating it um, and growing organic food for our community um, ever since. Um, we started by selling veggies at the farm gate um, and also online. Um, so when we first started, um, Brett was still working part-time. And so by selling online, that gave us the opportunity and a little bit of flexibility of how we can um, introduce our vegetables into the market, um, given that we didn't have much um, time on the weekends because that was my main opportunity, still working full-time, um, getting out into the garden and, and getting everything established. Um, so we gave the market to skip and that really actually helped us out because um, when, when COVID hit, we were all set up with um our online channels for for our customers and the local community really backed us and that gave us kind of the push we needed um, to show that we can actually do this and um, and continued on with our venture. Um, and then actually by the end of 2022, you went full time. Yeah, so September 2020, I went full time um, in the garden. So I'm a full time farmer now and I have been for a couple of years. Um, so it's me, my mum helps out, James is, um, helps on the weekend because he's still working full time. Um, and then we employ some part time seasonal workers throughout um, the spring and summer to help us along. Um, so by that, by 2020, we started our first CSA, which was, um, pretty cool, but daunting. Um, and we've slowly been growing, um, a CSA kind of based system ever since. Um, and now kind of moving into spring, um, we'll be doing another one. Um, and we get up to about 60 CSA members per season, which is pretty awesome for us, um, to see our community getting behind us and supporting us. Um, with that food and the way we do that. Um, so, yeah. and Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about the Earthworkers course, which um, transformed the garden a little bit. And um, as you can see on the side, the way we grow within our beds. Um, so in 2021, Britt did the Earthworkers course. Um, and then I did the most recent course um, earlier in the year. Um, and it really just encouraged our passion because sometimes you need that reinvigoration working in the garden yourselves and, and just being with like-minded people and and what you learned there was, um, was awesome. And especially in regard to the science and then actually practically going out and doing that um, and and really fueled us um, with, with creating a community around what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So, um, we are currently, this is our garden um, in April this year, so we're currently growing um, just under um, 1,500 metres squared. Um, we've built our own three tunnel houses. Um, and, yeah, we're um, feeding, like, up to 60 families a week, plus we've got a little farm shop, which we top up twice a week. Um, and our goals are just to keep keep growing, fo- climate focus growing, encourage other people to get into growing um, and learning and really just connect people with food and the soil and just kind of inspire. Hi, it's Sarah Smuts kennedy vision holder of For the Love of Bees. It's exciting to be here today with mentors Daniel Sherman and Levi Brindenson Hall at the Tom Tip Farm with Brittany and James. 
Hi. Um, what we've learned from Earthworkers is um, to increase the diversity um, by polycropping and gilding in our garden. Um, it's been a huge game changer for us. Um, and it's definitely given us like a bit more confidence to companion plant and kind of challenge some of those conventional ideas about what grows well together um, and kind of, yeah, create more diversity within our beds. Yeah, and it also, I think one one big game changer for us is that it definitely forces our creativity that we have in the garden because it depends, growing changes every season and with us, we don't know the timing exactly of when things will, will be coming ready to come into the garden. So we have to think about the way they grow and then we have a, a polycrop right in front of us here and then we put that together through what we're thinking will work in this timing that they grow in the garden. Yeah, and it's quite cool as well because I guess you kind of move away from the idea of like crop rotations, like what needs to go in the bed next because we're kind of already comboing those together um, anyway. So we don't really have to worry about that so much because we're crop rotating within the bed already. Um, it also works really nicely for us because our garden's based on like a CSA um, weekly harvest box kind of model so we need at least i don't know 12 to 15 varieties of vegetables ready each week that needs to change to give variety for those boxes so by having that staggered planting within the beds it means that we can have variety growing and ready to harvest at different times um, for those boxes rather than having something all ready all at the same time that we've got surplus of and not, don't really know what to do with. So it works quite well with our model of growing that way. So our first question um, is regarding cover cropping. Um, so we obviously do this a lot in our garden and love kind of giving some beds a rest um, and also the diversity and life that the cover crop brings to the garden and feeding back into the soil. But we just aren't 100% sure if there's a right or wrong way of cover cropping. So for example, um, I think we've got down packed like the species because we just throw in like so many different um, cocktails of species together and I use old seed as well um, and it's lush and grows really well but I guess it's how long does the cover crop want to be in the ground for is there a certain time um, that you should be planting them or shouldn't be planting them when should we cut them how should we cut them how long should the we kind of let that be sitting on this on the ground before we replant into the cover crop beds um, is there materials that we should be should or shouldn't be covering with um, yeah, and how, yeah, that's pretty much our question about cover cropping. Um, the first thing I guess is, is to answer is, is there a right way or wrong way to cover crop? <clears throat> um, uh, I guess the simple answer is uh, no, um, but there are things that will be better done in some circumstances than others, depending on where your soil organic matter levels are. Um, but in general, cover cropping doesn't, do um, a huge amount to lift organic matter levels. Um, it feeds the, it creates a lot of, it, it sort of increases the amount of soluble organic matter and, 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 and nitrogen retaining back in that soil. So it kind of feeds the biological cycle, which is um, obviously improving soil health, but it's not necessarily having a, a massive impact. So like if you were to leave the, uh, the cover crop material on the bed, um, and that's generally kind of how you're supposed to do it because the idea then is that's a weed suppressant. So for the crop that you're going to plant into it, if you can, particularly using transplants, you can plant through that sort of uh, we'll call it trash lying on the, the bed, the, the green material that you've cut down or, or bent down or, or crimp rolled or whatever your process is or mulched, um, but you actually plant through that um, and that remains there um, breaking down, it works quite well. It's often used for a weed barrier, so weed suppressants. Um, so having a cover crop that's lying on top of the soil and planting through it is a, is a good sort of weed management strategy, um, particularly in the early days of establishing uh, a bed where the weed pressure can be a lot higher. Um, in, in regards to when you should cut it, it does actually depend on the species um, that you're actually cover cropping with. So some species, some of the legumes don't actually start to sort of um, a nitrogen fixing process really kick in 
um, into gear apparently until they're actually flowering. Um, so the idea with lupins is that you you would actually allow them to flower but before the uh, seed pods had um, set, uh, you would then uh, cut the crop to try and um, potentially prevent a whole lot of lupin seeds um, coming into your beds. Um, so it does depend on the individual species. Other ones, um, if you leave it too long, it tends to get woodier. So, um, and then what you create is a cover crop that takes a lot longer to break down. So if you cut them when they're um, a, a, a green, um, in many cases, you're looking for the ideal time to cut the cover crop. So it will terminate so that you actually have, you kill off the cover crop so that it doesn't, um, if you cut it and it doesn't start to grow back again, if you leave it too long, you can have a lot of a lot more problem with regrowth um, after cutting cover crops. So that the key thing about the species in the cover crop is they should be able to be um, terminated um, by simply uh, mulching the top off or, or bending the top off, um, and then that would stop the regrowing. So you know it is you've got a range of quite a lot of questions within that one question you've asked but those are the, the basic answers um weed mat is 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 obviously finally recognized using weed mat in terms of not creating an aerobic environment like you do when you uh, cover um that sort of thing with plastic um so um but obviously if, or in, in a perfect world you wouldn't need to use um any of the weed mat um you would just simply terminate the crop allow it to Generally, you want it to start composting down a bit um, uh, before you sort of plant um, something in it. Because sometimes, particularly if you're rolling a crop, like the, the, the whole idea of rolling it, say crimp rolling it, where you roll the crop, you're not actually removing roots or, or the, the top. You're just basically bending the stems, breaking them and laying them flat. Is that, it, that sometimes uh, it's quite good to leave them there for... Um, two or three weeks and then roll them again because you that you can actually see the cover crop in some cases might start to grow back and that second um, crimping or second rolling um, however you're doing it um, can be um, a useful um, process uh, to make sure that you've actually properly terminated the cover crop um, so yeah as far as cutting it I mean mulching it is is a good way to terminate it um, but it usually requires a, a mulching mower or some piece of machinery to run over it um, you can see you would have seen on YouTube videos people using a board and basically um, the old crop circle method they talk about with two people in a board and basically stomping on it um, to create the uh, you know to crimp the, um, to crimp it um, and there's other people go as far as actually creating little mini crimp rolling um, systems um, uh, with a roller. Um, but I've also seen it done even with a um, uh, with like a lawn roller and that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, there's quite a lot of different ways to um, to get this. Um, but uh, it's really, I guess, the other thing is that it wouldn't necessarily be something that you would continue to to you need to use. It's very good in the establishment phase of the of um of a growing area but it's not necessarily something that we would use um over and over and over and over again we'd rather see um food crops going in and creating the biomass um and leaving residue behind and 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 just keep that growing so you're producing um food off that space uh, cover cropping is very much about dealing with weed pressure and um an establishment more than anything else really great answers daniel um I'd just like to chime in one more thing while we're still on the cover crop here, which is basically, um, you, you summed it up perfectly at the end, is like, um, it's a tool that you're using. Why are you using it? Um, I've used it very successfully to, when you've got just straight grass, as a lot of people do, you've got straight grass, you put your compost down. Um, if we look at those two words, cover and crop, that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to cover the surface. So a lot of cover crops are sown directly with seed into the soil. Um, and the purpose of that is for absolutely maximum photosynthesis. The densities that we're rolling with with these cover crops are 10, I don't know, if not 100 times more dense than what you're going to get with seedlings. That's just that's just a fact. You, know, you can plant 100 seedlings per square metres. If you seed... A cover crop in some of these ways is a whole lot more than a hundred plants growing per it, and that's how they get. That's how they are so effective at suppressing weeds because 
the crops that you sow are the crops that come up. You just don't give any other um, sort of weed species or grass uh, a sort of a show in, in doing it. So I think in terms of that early stage, they're exceptionally handy. If you've got a high grass pressure, you sow your cover crop seed really dense in springtime, you let it grow up, and then you're using it as a transition phase into um you know a cropping bed context um then it's a really handy tool um but really think of it as um you know like what, what we teach in earth workers is that you can actually have a cover crop with seedlings as well what defines that that word cover crop is mainly that um your species that you've chosen are super dense and they're growing in your bed altogether so that's really what what we're looking for yeah and I would just um, reiterate what both of them have said. There was a period of time where Levi was doing a lot of what we do, more traditional cover crops. And then we also had a taking a massive leap forward in our project where the conversation was around, it's about density of photosynthesis. And for a lot of people with very small farms, they actually need to be generating food yeah. out of those beds um, as much as possible and so really turning if you've got a lot of space the cover the traditional cover crop can actually be a way of keeping your garden beds really activated um, while you don't have the time to give them with your um, food crops but in a small farm like OMG every garden bed needs to be um, producing as much food as possible as well as as much photosynthesis and that's where the polycropping really starts to replace the cover crop as a strategy because you have those multiple species and I just wanted to just for those of you who haven't done the earth workers you would have heard Daniel at the beginning of his answer for Brit and James was around um, talking about organic matter and soluble um, carbon so what he's referring to with the soluble carbon is the sap that the plants are producing each day, um, that's, that is actually carbon and it's soluble carbon and that is going into the soil at the end of every day through the exudate process. So that's the flooding of that soluble carbon into the soil system and that's what's actually feeding the microbes. And with the diversity of um, soluble carbon, that's the diversity of sap from lots and lots of different plants is what's actually repairing the soil system as quickly as possible. So our second question um, is around um, potatoes and kumara that we're looking to plant this season. Um, we've just had some challenges in the plant in the past about uh, no dig potatoes, and um, we found that we've used quite a lot of compost um, in order to get them started. And then throughout the season, we find that the potatoes do start going um, through, and you see bare pot potato. And, and so it's it's affecting affecting their growth. So we we're wondering if you had any insight um, as to how we can go about it for the season ahead. Okay, I'll I'll start with the fact that um, yeah, no dig kumara and potatoes can be done um, in I guess very uh, in certain terms non traditional ways where you would have seen people using um, wire mesh cages. Um, or growing in containers and building those up um, to create quite a mass density within a small space. And so essentially, rather than going down in the soil, they're com coming up constantly. Um, and I guess that's one way of doing it. But the scale of that, obviously, is um, they're still somewhat limiting. Um, you're quite right in the sense that um, you do need to keep them covered. Um, they, they, they don't, they, you know, you do have to constantly keep these things covered. So there isn't really a, a set way of doing um, sort of no dig um, kumara potatoes in a particularly large scale without kind of creating a, some sort of raised bed system where you're actually um, able, you're, you're sort of lifting up the material around the, the sides of the um, uh, of the root uh, system to, uh, you know, keep it covered. Um, so for all intents and purposes, I mean, there are certain things um, that uh, you're looking to do, um, let's say minimum till, um, so you're not doing mass tilling um, before planting. Um, if you've got a really good, 
uh, what we call tilt, so that the soil structure is nice and loose and open. Um, I've seen some beds where it's possible for them to actually push the potatoes into the seed potatoes actually into into the soil um, relatively easily and and grow it from there. So they're not they're doing as little disruption as possible. But having said that, um, in some cases where it's necessary. Um, you know, and you're doing it on a larger scale, it's pretty much unavoidable. There's going to be some form of tillage involved, especially in the, um, you know, in, in the harvesting of them, um, unless you go down the route of doing those massive big um, cages or growing potatoes in some form of containerized system. That's kind of how I view it, really. I have a question. Um, it's also for you, Daniel, in terms of you're using that compost to get them started. Um which you know enables you or topsoil or whatever to, to get them kind of kick started. Now, obviously, um, you know, some people might look at well, really, all they require is cover at that stage, right? So, you know, are there other mechanisms? Can you cover them with, say, um, grass clippings? Can you cover them with wood chip? Obviously, you're going to be introducing a big rush of nitrogen, so that might not be with grass clippings, huge rush of nitrogen. Um, is that going to be problematic? And then I've got another thing I'll come back to, but I'd love, Daniel, you just, because I know some people will be thinking through those sorts of things. So yeah. can we have a clarity around that? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, we'll go back to, we'll start with the wood chip um, mm. scenario. Um, the interesting thing about potatoes, of course, is that they're, they're, as everybody will aware, they're very high in potassium, which also means that they need, um, to get really big tubers, they get filled with potassium. So they need a lot of uh, potassium available in the soil, much higher than, say, your leafy green type um, vegetables. Um, and so wood, rotted wood chip, and I say rotted because it needs to be well and truly in the decomposing, decomposition stage um, for it to be able to be added to a garden without it causing the nitrogen drawdown that um, fresh wood chip can do um, because it, it, it sucks basically the available nitrogen out to break it down. But if you start with rotted wood chip, the thing about wood chips is they largely add potassium and organic matter um, to the soil. Um, they don't add, they don't bring a lot of anything else. So in, in the terms of growing things like potatoes and using um, really well rotted wood chips um, around them to sort of help mulch them and perhaps um, help raise um, the uh, uh, the um, the area around or underneath the potato um, of the plant itself. Uh, that's quite a useful um, strategy. If you're, it helps with weed suppression. It, it also um, prevents you from necessarily digging up even more soil and adding it um, around the potato. But again, it's all about scale. You know, it depends on how large the scale is and what the availability of materials you have to do these various different things as to whether they're possible or not. Um, I know in some cases, um, uh, some of the projects um, uh, or some of the, the gardens in your sort of situation have sort of given up, not necessarily looking at potatoes as something that they actually really want to grow. It just kind of, it doesn't really fit very well into a small urban space. So lots, lots of them don't actually get in potato production at all. Um, Kuma is that, slightly different. The other thing that Brittany and James do have access to, though, is a lot of potentially grass clippings. Um, and allowing those grass clippings, you know, to, um, you know, stockpiling them, allowing them to turn to carbon before you're putting them on, um, allowing those rotting down too. So it's, you know, you could be, um, you know, with your available excess grazing, there could be an opportunity to kind of do some planning to have that material. Um, and then that obviously becomes, um, you know, at the end of the season, um, material that you could then put through a composting process, for example. Mm. I did um, Coomera myself. I tested Coomera myself this last year in raised garden beds, and I started my farm as um, that was going to be my teaching space. Um, we no longer, we don't, we never got to teach there because we teach now at ONG. But um, I did raised garden beds to have all the different strategies available to teach to. I'm not a fan of the raised garden bed. Um, very much anymore. I think they use a lot of extra water and um, I don't think they're necessary. However, I've got them. So I um, took my um, tipu and I put them into a raised garden bed. What was fantastic about that is that I didn't need to do any soil disruption whatsoever to establish them. Um, and then I didn't have to build a mound. 
uh, what I got very good size Kumara by them. Um, I have to, I'm going to have to wrap this up. I got very good size Kumara because they had a really good um, amount of soil to establish in. And then, of course, they hit the ground and they then just formed, you know, amazing size. Um, and then actually, as long as I wet um, the soil at the end, I was able to pull them out with almost no disruption. And I'm now growing uh, cauliflower in those beds um, with other brassicas and other things. And I'm getting very good size heads on them. So there was almost no, no disruption. And the amount of Kumara per square meter that I got was phenomenal. So um, I'm now really re-looking at those raised garden beds as a strategy to grow um, those types of crops um, with very little tillage and very good um, harvest per square meter at the end. I know that we've come right to the end of our time. So unless Levi, I think Levi have might something to add to that. Um, see how we go. Just a couple of things to wrap up on both those crops because I truly do love growing both those crops. Um, Kumara, I tell you right now, will be a lot easier than potatoes to grow. Obviously the potatoes, as they grow, they need that continual mound up and they form potatoes around the stems. My first bit of advice with that would be to roll with a deep mulch system. So you can actually, you could actually, we were talking about cover crops before, you can seed your potatoes, seed your cover crops, let the potatoes grow up through it, chop the cover crops down and mulch up your potatoes. Or um, I've thought for a very long time of planting quite aggressive grasses on grasses and you could also do broad beans or whatever you wanted edible on the sides but looking for something on the side of the bed that's actually going to grow up dense and support your potatoes growing that you can cut and just mulch over the top as you can straw or hay would do that i would be wary as sarah said of putting anything too seriously green over the top of it because we don't want to get that rotting effect happening there um and in regards to the Kumara, um, they obviously don't need mounded up time and time again to form a nice hard tuber. They need to have um, like a kind of like a pan at the bottom. So you could get that by raking the compost on the top surface of your bed into a little mound, planting the Kumara there. And remember when you plant your Kumara, um, what happens is you plant your tipu and it takes them about one month um, until they get until they sort of go crack and start shooting out all their leaves. So there is time there to put in um, a cover crop, whether that's a food crop, vegetable crop, or flowers, or whatever it is around the kumara just to cover that soil. Um, and the last thing I'll say on these two crops is, especially kumara, they harvest in autumn. And obviously, as you say, you, you, you dig the soil as you harvest them. So um, just thinking in terms of crop rotation, um, Potatoes and kumara, when they come out, you're left with a lovely till, a lovely tilth in your bed. So just put carrots after that into your crop rotation. There's no weeding, nothing necessary to do. You'll be able to seed, rake that bed out straight after harvesting your kumara or your potatoes, and then following day, you know, boom, you're in with uh, you're in with your carrots and you've got really nice free draining soil or whatever. Thank you so much. Super helpful. I'm really excited to have a go at growing the kumara potatoes and good tip with the carrots. That's awesome. And um, yeah, the cover cropping, I think we've already, we're, we're doing it right. So that's good to know. Yeah. And it's yeah. good to know that we have our poly crops that we have existing in the garden already doing what the cover crop is supposed to be doing yeah. for us. And so we'll just be looking at those newly established beds and, and how we'll be creating those going forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. If you are inspired to become an earth worker and learn more about regenerative organic horticulture, look up our earth workers program on our website to register for our upcoming courses. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support us in making more, we welcome donations on our website for the love of bees For the love of bees is a charitable trust creating a system of self-sustaining urban farms in Aotearoa that cultivate quality food for local people through regenerative organic horticultural practices that heal the ecosystem. Through these sites, we create happier and healthier ecosystems and resilient connected communities. We also create and share high quality, accessible educational experiences around what a truly regenerative world looks like. For the Love of Bees aims to become a world leading example of partnership, 
regeneration and participation for a thriving collective future. We started in 2016 as an optimistic and love-centered approach to engaging with ecosystem well-being in a time of climate uncertainty.